I'm going to be talking about, uh, as Ron said, five lessons in distributed databases. So uh, I haven't been working in databases for 40 years, but I have been working in databases for 10 years. And uh, we've seen some uh, interesting changes as this field has matured uh, in that time. So when I'm talking about databases, I'm going to use it for the purposes of this talk, uh, talking about the upper right-hand quadrant here, the scale-out operational databases. So there's other types of databases. In particular, I like to uh, divide the world of databases, broadly speaking. And I know there's kind of hybrid uh, options, but just really broadly, you've got your operational and you've got your analytical options. So um, I'm, I'm approaching this firmly from the operational side. Uh, and so what I'm going to say is going to apply a little bit less to, uh, to some of these other boxes here. So my first lesson learned is if it's not SQL, it's not a database. And this might come as like, well, duh. But uh, you know, we started off 10 years ago doing something called NoSQL. And so we said, uh, you know, this really started with, with kind of a web uh, 1.0 kind of thing where, where eBay was one of the first ones where they started running into how big you can build an Oracle box. So they had the biggest Sun Microsystems boxes money could buy at the time. Uh, and uh, first they started sharding their data uh, vertically, meaning they put different tables and different categories of data on different big Sun boxes. And even that you know, hit uh, a ceiling. And so then they started having to shard horizontally and, and splitting a single table across multiple machines. Uh, so they, they were pioneering this between around 1999 and 2002. Um, and then uh, some of the other big internet companies, uh, Amazon published a uh, paper on a database called Dynamo, not to be confused with DynamoDB 10 years later, but uh, the idea is, you know, we, we, we're hitting this same problem of we need to scale out our, the data for the applications we're building. Google published the Spanner paper uh, around the same time. And then you, you, you started getting this explosion of uh, open source, mostly open source projects dealing with that with this first bullet here with uh, Voldemort and React. These are all projects that are all, uh, I don't want to say dead because most of them are open source. So, all of them are open source, so the source is still out there, but they're not uh, successful. They're not being actively actively used. Um, and then you had a few more that are still around today, Cassandra, HBase, and MongoDB. Those are kind of the, the big ones that you still hear about. Maybe a couple others. Couchbase is still around, uh, kind of a descendant of CouchDB. But uh, you know, people were looking at this problem of as we're moving into kind of at the time web, kind of web 2.0 and people were building cloud applications and my problem is not so much I want to deal with the data set for a single company, which is what relational databases were built for, but I want to deal with a data set for an entire country and I want to run my application with users, you know, tens of millions of users. That's the problem that we need to solve. So uh, again, 10 years ago, this is kind of where we were starting off in NoSQL. And I see Rob's grinning already. Have you seen this before? Not, just, not, a, just a fast not, reader. Just in, real, just in real life. Yeah. So the early you know, NoSQL databases, this is kind of where we were, where you know, it's not super user friendly and your interface to getting data in, in and out of it is, um, you know, a, dist uh, a MapReduce function in Erlang or a thrift uh, key value API like we had in Cassandra. So uh, what, what we started, so my, I came to uh, Cassandra not as one of the original authors. Cassandra was open sourced by a group of engineers at Facebook who were uh, building a tool, a database to solve their inbox search problem. And I came to it as kind of the, you know, immediately after Facebook open sourced it, they contributed it to Apache. I got involved because Rackspace hired me and said, hey, we're hitting this need for a scalable database as well. Uh, so I, I started working on Cassandra as one of the first committers outside of Facebook. And 
uh, what we had was this API called Thrift. So it's still around, it's an Apache project, gives you an RPC layer, uh, it's a lot like uh, Captain Proto or GR GRPC in spirit. Um, but it's, it's fairly low level. So we had things like, you know, fetch a row and then it would give you back a dictionary of, uh, of tuples in that row. But there wasn't anything like uh, select or where clauses or predicates uh, or, or even indexes. Um, so that was a, an obstacle, a barrier to entry. So one of the things we did as we started evolving this is we said, okay, how can we make this more familiar to people coming from a relational background, which is to a first approximation, everyone. Uh, and so we kind of evolved our way into what we call the Cassandra Larry query language or CQL. So today, uh, all of the successful projects uh, are using either a, a language based on SQL or they're, they're saying, hey, we're actually SQL. So if we look at, uh, I've, I've got quotes around SQL here for Cosmos to be in Cloud Spanner. Uh, for Cloud Spanner, it's actually uh, a pretty accurate description to say that Cloud Spanner uses SQL. Uh, everything except for the insert part is, is actually a full uh, SQL variant. Cosmos DB, it's a little bit iffier. You start to look at it and you say, well, it's kind of SQL if I squint right, but I have to squint pretty hard. Uh, and so with, with Cassandra, we said, hey, we're gonna call it CQL because we do wanna be upfront that you know, we don't wanna set your expectations so high that, that you're disappointed when you look at it and say, you know, this part doesn't match uh, actually what I expect coming from SQL. Uh, Couchbase has something that's pronounced nickel. Uh, but it, it's similar as saying we have a document database and we want to give you a query language that looks a lot like SQL. Uh, so the, there's two big exceptions here, uh, which are MongoDB and DynamoDB. DynamoDB gives you a key value API and MongoDB gives you a JSON based document API. Uh, and I, so both of these are, are very successful, very popular and I think that they're popular despite their query language. Uh, I, I think that both of these databases are probably going to end up adding a SQL-ish uh, query language uh, eventually. People are going to demand that. That's my prediction. Um, I don't have any insider information on that. Uh, my, my second lesson is that it takes five to 10 years to build a database. So one of the corollaries here is if you see someone announcing their new database uh, on Hacker News uh, next week, you know, be patient, like come back and check on it in five years. Uh, <laughs> if, if it's still around, then maybe it'll be ready to, to start using. So there's, a, there's an analyst named Kurt Monash, and he says, uh, rule one, it's gonna take five to seven years and tens of millions of dollars, and that's if things go extremely well. Rule two is you aren't an exception. Uh, and, and this is actually really true in my experience. So, uh, and, and I'll give that to you a little bit in a, a lens of some of the mistakes I made. Uh, so I started a company called Datastax to commercialize Apache Cassandra. And I was a first time founder. My co-founder was a first time founder. Uh, we made some mistakes. So I'll give you some, uh, if, if you're ever thinking of starting a company around your cool open source technology, uh, maybe, maybe this will help. So the first mistake is uh, I spent uh, 18 months at Rackspace, and that doesn't sound like a super long time, like, oh, you missed your window. And the window was still open, but uh, you know, during that 18 months, you know, the, the competition was heating up, they were staffing up, they were hiring big teams to, to uh, improve their technology, and I was working with a team of me uh, at Rackspace to start with. It grew to a team of four by the time I left, uh, but that's pretty small potatoes versus uh, tens of millions of dollars in venture capital building an engineering team. So uh, you know, we, we, I, we were 12 months behind where we should have been uh, when I did start, start the company, in my opinion. Uh, the second mistake was raising a two and a half million dollar Series A, and so this is this is hard to wrap your mind mind around. At least it was for me. 
that this is actually a really tiny amount of money when you're building a, a company. Uh, to put that in perspective, uh, Datastax did uh, you know, Cassandra summits for a number of years. We're rebooting that this year uh, called Datastax Accelerate. But putting on that conference costs roughly a million dollars. Like, and that's out of Datastax's pocket. That's after the sponsors and everything else and after the registration fees. So like putting, you know, doing things as a, as a company and trying to build a community and trying to build a product is really expensive. Um, I remember uh, my, my co-founder telling me in all seriousness after we signed one of our first uh, deals where uh, the, the customer was paying us $80,000 a year uh, and uh, my co-founder said, you know, a few more of these deals and you know, we'll never have to raise money again. Um, so fast forward four rounds of funding, Datastax has raised about $104 million total. Uh, and that's just, that's, that's what you need to do. So if you look at other companies doing a, doing a Series A these days, uh, most of them, you know, $13 million is one I saw recently, uh, $17 million another. So this is, we, were, we were low by uh, almost an order of magnitude. Uh, so uh, that, was, that was just a mistake we made out of inexperience. Another one is that we, we didn't start getting serious about selling the product, and in particular, selling to enterprises until we were about a year into after starting the company. So, you know, it, it's, it was, so I come from an engineering background, uh, and my co-founder also came from an engineering background, and so I think we kind of, at least I had the idea that, you know, if you're building a great product, then the world will kind of automatically recognize that somehow and you know, call you on the phone and say, hey, how can I buy your product, right? Like that's, that's not how it works. So uh, the, a really great piece of uh, reading, it was originally given as a, as a talk, but it, uh, he turned it into a written form. Uh, a physicist named uh, Richard Hamming, I highly recommend Googling this uh, when you get on Wi-Fi much later after my talk. Um, he gave a talk called You and Your Research. And he talks about a couple things. One of the things he talks about is, uh, it's, it's aimed at scientists, but I think it works for engineers as well. One of them, he says, find out what the big problems are in your field and then go try to solve them. Like, nope, if you're working on a problem that doesn't matter, like, who cares, right? Maybe you're successful, maybe not, but who cares? But if you work on the, the most important problems, you know, if you succeed, then you know, you've changed the world. And even if you don't succeed, you're, you're probably advancing the state of the art and, and working on something important. Uh, but his, his, the second point that he, threw, he, he makes almost as a throwaway comment, he says, you need to spend half of your time doing great work and half of your time telling people about the great work you're doing. And so it, as, as programmers, there's a bunch of ways you can do that, right? You can, uh, you can give talks at conferences, you can do, you know, write blog posts, you can be active on Twitter and you know, engage with colleagues there. Um, but just like writing code and putting it on GitHub, that doesn't count. Like that's the doing great work part. The, now you need to go tell people about it. So, so I brought that bias into uh, data stacks, and so it took us longer than, than we should have to get serious about sales, and that was, that was another mistake. Um, this was just kind of a self-inflicted wound that we changed the company name. Uh, we started off calling it Riptano, and then we brought in a, a VP of product who said, Riptano, I don't know what the hell Riptano means. Like, we need this name to mean something. We changed it to Data Stacks, but that cost us some more time because then I was going to conferences and, and saying, hey, I'm from Data Stacks uh, evangelizing Apache Cassandra. And they said, hey, I thought Riptano was the Cassandra people. Uh, so we were kind of fighting ourselves. And then finally, uh, I, we, we, got, we drank too much of the open source Kool-Aid. So um, you can build a successful company uh, with an open core model, but there has to be something around the core that people are willing to pay for. So uh, our first stab at this was uh, adding 
Hadoop at the time, Hadoop Analytics to Cassandra, and we called that Brisk, and then we open sourced it on GitHub and said, hey, look, aren't we great? Aren't we nice people? We're giving all this stuff away. You should give us money. Like, that value proposition doesn't make sense for, for most people with checkbooks. Uh, so we, we evolved our direction. Today, Datastax Enterprise is, uh, is not open source, and it, it is more of that classic open core model, but it took us a while to get there. So Kurt Mon Monash has some examples of what he means when he talks about it's going to take you uh, five to seven years, he says, to, to build a production-ready database. So you know, you've got concurrent workloads uh, that you did in the lab. Um, Real-world real workloads are notoriously difficult. You're probably going to be, need to build custom tools. Nothing off the shelf is going to do exactly what you want it to do. And even then, you're going to hit the limits of your uh, workload conditioning, and you're going to need to go to customers and say, hey, can, can, we do, can we record a sample of your live traffic and use that to... Uh, do benchmarks against our product and make sure there aren't performance regressions because no synthetic workload uh, is, you know, captures the, the complexity. Uh, and then I think this is another good one at the bottom. The minor edge cases, you, you know, they're not minor. Uh, so it's, it's actually really easy to build a database that's 10 times faster than uh, Oracle or 10 times faster than Cassandra at a narrow use case. And it's really difficult to expand that to, to everything. Um, it's kind of like uh, where in Buffett says, it, it's remarkably easy to, to get a 10% rate of return in the market and remarkably difficult to do better than that. Uh, kind of a, a database version of, of that. So in Cassandra, here's some of the things that uh, took a lot more effort uh, than, than we thought they should. Uh, each of these subsystems uh, went through two or three iterations to get it to where it's in a, it's in a pretty good spot. Uh, so hinted handoff, that's when, uh, so Cassandra's an, an AP system, and I'll, I'll dive into that in just a second. But that means that each replica is, is uh, independent and can serve reads and writes without having to consult the other replicas. And so that means that if I uh, send an update for a row to, to the cluster, and two of the replicas that handle that row are down, then the replica that accepts it says, okay, I'll catch those guys up later, and when, it, when, they, when they come back up or they reconnect to the network, it sends the updates they missed. That's what hinted handoff is. Um, the other thing that, that probably bears some explanation here is Paxos. We use Paxos for what we call lightweight transactions and gives you a way to kind of opt out of that uh, AP world and into a serializable one. Uh, and, and this is, it's just a difficult thing to do. Uh, Cassandra is, um, com I, I tweeted that Cassandra was the first open source implementation of Paxos to, to be production ready. Uh, someone from Comcast reached out to me and said, hey, we've got this Paxos project on GitHub that's before yours, uh, so I guess I'll have to settle for a second. But um, probably the, the most, I'll settle for the most widely used uh, open source implementation of Paxos. So that, that five to seven years uh, guideline of Kurtz worked out pretty accurately for, for Cassandra. Uh, from being an Apache top-level project to uh, version 3.0, really nailing uh, those bullet points on the previous slide. Um, and you might think, well, wait a second. How come you're calling it 3.0 if you didn't nail those things until now? What was 1.0? It's, you know, it's great inflation. It, it happens to, to everything. Um, so the, the third lesson is, is that the customer is always right. And so... That bears some explanation. So if you're coming from sales, that probably makes a lot of sense to you. Um, but if you're an engineer, you're thinking, wait a second, I can think of this time the customer was wrong, and this time, and this time. Like, there's a pretty long list, right? Um, so I've been in that situation as a kind of de facto uh, product manager for Cassandra, where I've, I want to qualify this a little bit, uh, because I felt like my, my job for years was to tell people, no, you're doing it wrong. Uh, and 
you know, if you were using Cassandra correctly, then those problems with hinted handoff wouldn't be biting you. Like you wouldn't have a problem if you were doing it correctly. Um, and so that's the mindset that I want to uh, address. It, not so much that the customer is literally always right, because of course that's not literally true, but the mindset that the customer is doing it wrong and that's why they're having problems, that's the problem. So for example, uh, in Cassandra, uh, if you did a sequential scan and you just said, here's, you know, I wanna scan the entire table for rows matching some predicates and it's not indexed, uh, I'm just gonna do this big ass scan. Um, so the f like super, super early, like version 0 0.9, this would just crash the cluster if your uh, data set were big enough because it would pull the entire result set into memory and try to send it over the socket and, and something would, uh, you, know, you know, the malloc would fail and, and things would go down. Uh, so uh, in, that, was the, that was our state of the art in, in 2012. So we said, okay, well, if the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of slap you on the wrist and, wrist and say, don't do that. We're gonna say, we're not gonna execute this query unless you add the keywords allow filtering. And that says, I understand that it's not designed to run uh, queries like this against unindexed data. So I'm gonna cross my heart, hope to die, that uh, you know, this won't bring down the server and so now you should let me do it. Uh, so when you, when you typed in the, the query the first way, you just say, you know, select this uh, predicate then the server sends you back an error and it helpfully says, if you want to do this query anyway, then you need to add allow filtering. So what everybody does is they say, well, of course I wanna run this query anyway, otherwise I wouldn't have done it in the first place. So they just hit the up arrow on their command line and add allow filtering and then they're good to go, right? So uh, the problem is that this is a, um, it's, it's a sneaky bug waiting to happen. Because on your laptop, it's gonna work fine, right? 100,000 rows, no problem. Uh, it's even probably gonna work fine in production for a couple weeks until it starts getting slower and slower. And if you don't look at that slowness as a warning and dig in to figure out what's going on, then your first real warning that there's a problem is that your, your, your server went down. So this was a bad solution. Uh, so we, we went back to the drawing board and said, okay, how can we, if people are gonna do this anyway, how can we make this safe? And we came up with the same solution that people who've been writing databases for, uh, database drivers for 30 years came up with, which is we're gonna you know, give the client back some of this data at a time and not, not, the, not materialize the entire result set. Uh, and in our, in our defense, um, you might say, well, why did it take you guys so long? In our defense, that thrift API that we were using to start with has no way to do this. Like it's built in that it, it's an RPC framework. So I give you the query, I get back the response. Like that's the only paradigm. So first we had to invent our, new, our own query language. Then we had to invent a protocol for it. Then we had to build drivers around it. That's, that's what took us so long. Uh, another example is Tombstone. So a Tombstone is generated in Cassandra when you perform a delete or if you insert a null that overwrites uh, a piece of data that, that was already there, both of those create tombstones. So uh, what I mean by that is, coming back to what I said at the beginning, that Cassandra is an AP system. So this is an AP in the sense of cap theorem, which says you can have consistency, availability, uh, or partition tolerance, but you can't have all three at once. And so what that means for databases or for distributed databases is that you can be consistent and partition tolerant or you can be available and partition tolerant, but you can't, you can't be consistent and available at the same time. Every once in a while someone says, oh hey, I've refuted the cap theorem, my database is all three, they're wrong. Um, that, that's kind of a, like, does this person know what he's talking about test? Uh, if, if they say they've defeated the cap theorem, then they don't. Um, but another thing that people sometimes say is, oh, I've decided that I'm going to build a CA system and I'm not going to worry about partition tolerance. Um, like, you don't get to choose that, right? Your, your network is what defines that. Like, 
switches always fail. Like there, there's always a situation where some of your machines can't talk to others of the machines. And then your job as an engineer is to decide what your, you know, what to do when that happens. And if you just, if, if you say, oh, that's never going to happen, I'm not going to decide, then you just have an undefined problem. It hasn't made the problem go away. So, so in a, in a CP system, if I can't talk to the other nodes, I need to wait until I have a quorum and then I can elect a new master and then I can proceed. And the uh, an AP system will say, I'd rather he keep handling requests and then reconcile with the rest of the, the cluster once connectivity is restored. So Cassandra takes that second approach, which means that there's some, some interesting problems that aren't necessarily obvious. So deleting is one of those. So if I, if I want to delete this row out of the user's table, then the, the node that I'm talking to, which is called the coordinator, says, OK, you replicas, I'm going to send out this tombstone for the JBLS row. So, and the reason is that. I, I need to avoid the situation where I, I do this delete, one of the replicas is down while the delete happens, the other two replicas remove the row, and then the replica that was down comes back up and says, oh, hey guys, I noticed you're missing this JB Ellis row. Here, let me send it to you. Now you have it again. So the tombstone says there was data here and it's suppressed. It's not supposed to be here anymore. And so we need to, that, that tombstone needs to live until all the replicas have deleted that row that they were supposed to delete. So uh, this, there, if you have a workload that generates lots of tombstones, uh, then you can, this can cause problems because uh, in particular, for instance, if, I have, if I'm building a queue where I say I'm going to insert this row into the table and once I've read it off with my, my consumers have read it off, then I'll, the consumers will delete it. Meanwhile, the producer adds more rows to the table, consumers read them off and delete them and so forth. So the, the problem is, is that my phone? I'm sorry. Didn't put it on uh, do not disturb. Um, the problem is, like, as you're scanning that row, as you're scanning that table and saying, give me the, the most recent row that hasn't been deleted, the database is going through in the background scanning past those tombstones. And so there's, uh, you know, again, you have this situation where everything works fine at first, and then you add more and more data in, and you delete more and more data out, you generate more and more tombstones, everything gets slower and slower. So our, our solution in 2013 was to add two configuration parameters. One of them was this warn threshold, at which point if I've scanned past 1,000 tombstones, then I'm going to log a warning that says, hey, you should look at this. Why is your application generating so many tombstones? And then we added a, a second threshold that was two orders of magnitude higher that says, OK, you still haven't fixed this, and I'm just going to kill the query rather than consuming resources getting slower and slower. Um, this isn't a great solution because the people watching those server logs, if there's anyone watching the server logs, aren't usually the same people writing the application. So there's, there's a disconnect there. We're, we're creating this warning that it's not going to the right people. So uh, five years later, six years later, we're closing in on a better solution on, on making this obvious. So the, the first thing we need, need to do is uh, be able to track at a much uh, finer grain of detail than we do today uh, which tombstones have actually been propagated to all the replicas, and we can remove them now. So uh, up until now, we have this thing called GC Grace Seconds, which I've abbreviated GCGS on this slide. And that says, I'm just going to assume that after two weeks, everyone has all the tombstones they need, and we can go ahead and delete them. Um, so that's a really blunt instrument. It, it works uh, fairly well, as long as you don't have machines that are disconnected for more than two weeks. Um, but uh, you know, it's not very performant because it leaves those tombstones around for the, that two week period. So the, the first uh, thing we need to do is, is track which ones have been propagated correctly. Um, and we need to do that in you know, hours instead of days. And then finally, uh, we want to be able to evict those from the data files, which is a process called compaction. 
So uh, we've, we've uh, nailed the first one of these uh, in code that isn't released yet, so sorry, but we, we have finished the code to do this. Uh, the second one has also been finished, and the third one is a work in progress. So uh, approximately six more years to, to finish this solution. Uh, another example is joins. So CQL, so I said there's differences from SQL. This is one of the biggest differences is that uh, we tell people, hey, when you have data that's on multiple machines, then doing a join between you know, table X and table Y when both of their rows are scattered across an 18 machine cluster, that's gonna be slow. You don't wanna do joins. You want to uh, denormalize your data instead so at, at write time, so that at read time, you can just go fetch it from a single partition in that denormalization that you created. Um, however, second bullet point, you know, people do this anyway. So we said, okay, well, maybe the problem is that denormalization is too hard, that we're telling people that you need to uh, manage that from your application, that every time you update table X, you also need to denormalize to tables Y and Z as well. And that's just a pain. So maybe that's one of the reasons people aren't doing that. So we created a feature called materialized views to do that automatically. And we said problem solved, right? But people are still doing joins. So uh, a number of other databases, uh, notably Cosmos DB and uh, Spanner are saying, you know what, we understand the joins are slow, uh, but if you really want to do it, then we'll give you that in the query language uh, instead of telling you, no, you can't do that. Uh, and that seems to be working pretty well for them. So in this case, I think that um, the answer is that you know, listening, listening to the customer uh, is sometimes the right thing to do, which was the, uh, the topic of this section. But uh, I think the, the reason why this is uh, a good example of, of why this is okay is that uh, joins are something that you're going to see the performance impact immediately, right? It's not something that it gets slower and slower over time. I mean, there, there's, there's kind of a, a cliff of slowness where, you, where you're not in memory anymore and you're having to hit disk, so there is that. Uh, but other than, other than that, you, you pretty much have a good idea of what your performance profile is going to be, so you, so you don't have this creep up on you. Um, finally, I, since I put in uh, one of the slides the tombstone warning configuration settings, I thought this was uh, appropriate to mention that um, a lot of times as engineers mm -hmm. will build into the system uh, you know, a configuration setting that says, you know, maybe you want to tune it like this, maybe you want to tune it like that. It's up to you. But as, especially as you get to something more complicated, then you're basically pushing that complexity onto the user, and more often than not, they're not equipped to cope with that. And, and they're gonna have a bad time, which means you're gonna have a bad time. So, uh, I think one, one of the lessons from the uh, section three, I think, is adding just enough magic is good. So uh, uh, joins in a database system is a good kind of magic. But we can take that too far uh, and trying to push that past the limits of, of what is reasonable causes problems. So some of this is where people are just flat out confused. I mentioned people who say that, that their database has refuted the CAP theorem or a, a queue that promises exactly once delivery or, or maybe even a vendor that's uh, a little bit optimistic about their SLA and they say, we give you four nines of reliability. Footnote, here's how we measure those four nines and it's, it's like, yeah, I, you've, you've seen that kind of SLA. So, um, this is, this is a, a paper uh, by some really smart uh, uh, grad students at the time. Now, uh, at least one of them is a, a professor uh, about a system called HStore. And so HStore, uh, so if, if you're familiar with Mike Stonebreaker, uh, his, uh, he likes to name, name his research databases something store. So, uh, 
uh, Vertica came out of uh, C store for columnar store. Uh, and so this one was H store for horizontally sharded storage. Uh, and so what, what they said was, okay, we, everybody understands that we need to do horizontal partitioning to scale, uh, but pushing that onto the, the user is a pain. And the users aren't always gonna do a great job choosing their partition keys and they would rather not have to think about that. So HStore says, if you tell us up front what your queries are, then we will generate the optimal partitioning for your data such that we can answer as many queries as possible from a single partition. And we'll do that, you, we'll do that automatically. You don't have to care. And uh, there were two problems with that. One is that um, the, you had to tell them what the queries were by writing Java stored procedures. And it turned out nobody wanted to do that. Um, but they fixed that. They, and uh, uh, they, they fixed that and they said, okay, we'll do it with SQL. And people still didn't like it. Because the problem is that everything worked great, except that every once in a while your queries would be two to three orders of magnitude slower, and you didn't understand why, because now it had to do a cross-partition join, but that wasn't obvious because you didn't know what the partitioning was. It had done that for you. So that's an example of good magic and good technology, but a bad user experience. Um, another example, I'm going to pick on a commercial product here, Google Spanner, uh, where they, they if I, I took this screenshot this morning, uh, they, they, the splash on the pages, this is a no compromise database, it's, it's relational, but it scales, and you, you don't have to care about it, it's just like, you know, MySQL, except it scales. So, my, one of my uh, favorite economists is uh, Thomas Sowell, and he says, uh, there are no solutions, there are only compromises. Um, and so that applies to a lot of things in engineering as well, where you know, just like the CAP theorem, sometimes you just can't have everything all at once. So in the, in the case of, of Cloud Spanner, um, it's built on a really brilliant architecture of uh, Paxos groups that are communicating via two-phase commit uh, using uh, atomic clocks baked into the hardware that nobody else has. Like it's, it's a really, the really smart people worked on this a really long time and they did, you know, it's a tour de force in a lot of ways, but the compromise is there's a, it, it's really slow at ingesting data or, or performing updates. So I, I looked around for, for benchmarks against Cloud Spanner. This is the, the best one I found. Uh, unfortunately, it's comparing against a slightly obscure database called Apache Kudu. Um, I said at the beginning that most databases are either operational or analytical. Kudu's trying to be a bit of both. Um, it's, it's also a, a fun project to look at and see what architectural choices they looked at. But uh, you know, if you don't know, uh, if you don't have a good rule of thumb for how fast Kudu is, at, at this benchmark, it's about half as fast as uh, Apache Cassandra. So this is just, I'm just gonna throw data into it, see how fast I can do a, a bulk load. So bigger is better. So on, on this uh, hardware, Kudu was doing 100,000 rows per second, and Spanner was doing uh, about 4,500. 4, so that, this is the compromise that, that they had to make. And maybe it's the right compromise. Uh, I don't know. I do think it's, uh, I, I don't think it's accurate to say that we built a database without compromises because there's no such thing. So if, if we're looking at you know, how much magic is okay, I don't think that I have a really great uh, one size fits all answer because I thought that joins was too much magic and it was a compromise on performance that, that was not gonna be acceptable. Uh, but uh, I think I was wrong about that. Uh, automatic partitioning, uh, apparently that's not okay. Uh, I don't think that, I don't have uh, 
numbers for Cloud Spanner's revenue, but as near as I can tell, it's not setting the world on fire in terms of adoption. So I think that uh, the compromises they make there are probably not okay. Um, so in general, I think the right way to think about this is how can we make this bottom bullet, how can we make the system more transparent while solving problems for the user instead of, uh, instead of leaking our abstractions to them and causing more problems than we're solving? So the, the final uh, lesson here uh, for me is, is that it's, it's about the cloud. So we've, we've come uh, 10 years into you know, NoSQL or distributed operational databases. Um, this is a slide from a Datastax presentation in 2011. So at the, I'll call your attention to the bottom bullet here where it says you know, it, this database is built to, to run in the cloud. Uh, then uh, six months later, we gave another presentation where we're talking about, look, our architecture is better because it, there's no single points of failure. It's designed to do asynchronous replication between multiple data centers uh, and uh, span between uh, multiple data centers in the cloud. Nobody was calling it hybrid cloud yet. Um, so we were, we were looking forward to that. And then today, I think it's fair to say that the, the cloud is here, hybrid cloud is here. Uh, the market has caught up with the technology in, in that respect. Um, so you've got analysts agreeing with that. Uh, that was JP Morgan. This is Gartner. Gartner says there's four, four kinds of hybrid cloud. Um, and if you start looking at this a little bit closer, then you start seeing holes in this. Um, and this was written by an analyst, not an engineer. Um, so for instance, you've got uh, architecture spanning, and they say that's one kind where you have a single cluster that's on-premises and also in the cloud. But then they say multi-cloud is when you have uh, on-premises deployments and also in the cloud. So there's definitely some overlap, right? These aren't distinct uh, categories. But I, th I do think it's useful uh, in terms of thinking, you know, how are enterprises thinking about multi-cloud and what uh, use cases should should we be thinking about in terms of that. So um, at Datastax, we often get stuck thinking about this one on the far left because that's what our software is good at. Like we can do a cluster that spans multiple data centers uh, and even you know on premises and off premises. But these these there's these other categories where it doesn't necessarily have to have that kind of connectivity, and that's worth recognizing as well. Uh, so we've got multiple analysts saying that cloud is here. Uh, Datastax also has its own internal uh, numbers saying, yeah, cloud is here. We've got customers using it. Uh, we've got customers doing hybrid. Um, so, okay, cloud is here. Now what? So in terms of uh, where the industry goes with databases, um, this is one of the best papers um, I would say one of the best papers ever written on databases and definitely one of the best on uh, cloud database architecture. So it's by the engineers at Amazon and they described how they built Aurora to scale uh, relational databases, primarily MySQL and PostgreSQL, uh, to scale those farther on top of their infrastructure. Um, so it's real. It's really brilliant about you know, and they talk. They, they describe how they push the replication logic into the storage layer uh, and do a whole bunch of optimizations like that. And this deserves to be along with. If you're interested in how databases work, this deserves to be on your list along with the the Spanner paper, the Dynamo paper uh, that I mentioned earlier that are considered classics. Um, so Andy Pavlo, who's uh, one of the authors of that uh, HStore paper I showed earlier, uh, he uh, did an interview recently and he says that um, in his opinion, and I think he's right, uh, the next trend in databases is going to be towards shared storage. And so we've, we've uh, you know, the past 10 years have been about shared nothing architecture. Each node in a cluster manages its own local storage and manages the replication to the other nodes. But uh, when, when you're building a database that's designed to run natively on uh, 
Amazon's uh, infrastructure or on GCP or on Microsoft Azure, you can assume that you have uh, network storage that's redundant, that's replicated, and, and you should be taking advantage of that when you're building your database. Because if, if I add a, a node to a Cassandra cluster today, then you know, there's, there's lag time, right? There's, a, if I go from a five node cluster to a 10 node cluster, then I think, oh great, I just doubled my capacity and uh, everything gets faster. The thing is that before everything gets faster, everything gets slower because I need to transfer that data from the replicas that own it now into the rep to the new replicas that I'm adding to the cluster. So you know, I'm, I'm adding load to the cluster before I'm removing load by, by spreading it out more. But if I'm building uh, on uh, AWS and I'm using EBS as my storage, now I can just take one of those EBS storage volumes and, and attach it to the new node that's joining the cluster. And I can do that in seconds instead of minutes or hours. So there's, there's some big advantages that we can start achieving uh, with our infrastructure when we start taking advantage of this new, uh, you know, this new cloud native world. So the, the next question for me, I think, that, I think it's fairly straightforward, very interesting, but very straightforward about how do you adapt a database to be cloud native? Then the next question that I don't think the industry really has a good answer for yet is, how do you take a database that you've built to be cloud native, and how do you translate that to an on-premises deployment? Because you know, we still have uh, something like uh, six, over 60% of Datastax customers want to have at least some deployment on premises. Um, so maybe, you know, is that gonna be Kubernetes based? Google announced a couple of weeks ago that they're bringing managed Kubernetes uh, to VMware uh, and to uh, other partners like HP, and this is called Anthos. Uh, so maybe, maybe it's gonna be a Kubernetes based stack. Um, maybe it's gonna be OpenStack, I think that's still around. Um, so, uh, I, this is kind of an unsolved problem that I, th I think we do need to solve to get to that next stage of, of hybrid cloud. And then I think there's a, a, an interesting question around what does open source look like in kind of a, a cloud first world uh, where you have uh, Amazon famously uh, offering Elasticsearch as a service. Uh, if they've made any commits to Elasticsearch uh, open source project, then it's not very many. Um, they just announced uh, more recently uh, Kafka as a service. And again, uh, definitely not big contributors to Apache Kafka. Uh, so there's, there's this, you know, you, there's this pattern of the cloud vendors monetizing these open source projects uh, without contributing back to them. So. I, th I think it's a different world than it was when I started uh, Datastax 10 years ago. Uh, and, and back then, if somebody came to me and says, hey, how do you feel about people who are using open source, but they're not paying Datastax? It's like, hey, I'm totally fine with that, right? Because if they're not, even if they're not paying me for commercial support, then they're probably filing bug reports. They, they might even be writing code and creating new features that benefit everyone. But the, the cloud vendors have kind of changed this dynamic because now there's this big consumer of open source projects that isn't contributing back. And so you've seen, um, you've seen Redis Labs uh, and Confluent and MongoDB, they've all uh, released uh, new licenses for their most recent versions of their software that in one degree or another, they're trying to address this problem. Um, so I, th I do think that the, the next 10 years of open source are gonna be very different uh, than the last 10. And again, I'm not exactly sure how that plays out, but it will be different. So in summary, uh, you know, if it's not SQL, it's not a database. Uh, if you're thinking of starting a database, it'll take you five plus years to, to get that production ready. Uh, you do want to listen to your users, but if your users are asking you to violate the laws of physics, then you should probably not listen to them. Uh, and finally, uh, the cloud is, this, is, is changing the game. Uh, and then finally, uh, my final thought, 
uh, I mentioned earlier that we're rebooting Cassandra Summit as Datastax Accelerate. That's going to be next month. It's going to be in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, and this will probably be, well, the, the, it won't be on the East Coast next year. So uh, definitely recommend uh, taking the chance to see it while it's, while it's relatively local. And with that, we have a few minutes for questions. So uh, just go ahead and, and uh, raise your hand, and I'll repeat your question so that uh, we can get it recorded. Uh, is that your question? Just so I, when I repeat, the question was, is open source Cassandra far behind Datastax's version because the, you know, the features we add on top of that open core are proprietary? Um, yes and no. So we, we, we have tried to take that, you know, the open core uh, model seriously, where if it's affecting the feature set that you're using to build your application, then we'll contribute that to, to open source. And if it's, a, if it's an optimization or a security uh, feature, then those we'll, we'll look at considering uh, keeping those to uh, data stacks. So that's kind of how we've tried to think about that. The, que the question is, do we create more problems down the road by adding features like joins that are potentially dangerous and potentially have you know, these uh, performance implications? Um, yeah, I do, think that that you, I do think that you want to be very cautious about what, you, what features you add and implicitly you're committing to supporting them for some period of, of, of years at least. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that it, it warrants being cautious, but in this case, I do think that the competition in the industry, uh, in particular uh, Cosmos DB is probably the closest to Cassandra that's doing this. Um, you know, they've demonstrated that they can do it successfully and that, that it creates value for their users. So I think that ignoring that at, that, at this point would, would be uh, just being stubborn on our part, I think. So the question was, uh, you know, I said that automatic partitioning uh, is not transparent enough and it causes problems when, when users encounter that lack of transparency. So have we considered doing multi-partitioning or writing the same data to multiple partitions uh, to uh, address the same problem in a different way? Uh, so that's what we're trying to do with materialized views is we're giving you, the, you're, you're opting into it. We're not doing anything uh, without telling you. But if you tell us, hey, I do want this data partitioned in two different ways, then we'll maintain that for you and, and keep those up to date for you. I could do a follow-up. I think you had said that that didn't quite work out for your customers. The follow-up was that that, uh, that didn't quite work out. And yeah, the context was uh, in the, you know, in the discussion about can we get away without having joins in the Cassandra query language, uh, does giving people a strong denormalization feature satisfy that same uh, problem that people are trying to solve? And, uh, and so we, we solved the materialized view problem, but it turns out that was not completely isomorphic to the problem that people were trying to solve with joins. So I think we, we end up in a place where we have both. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>